All right, next up, the friendliest atheist, Hemant Mehta. All right. Everyone can hear me okay? All right, so um, it's, I'm the only thing between you and dinner. This is power. Um, yeah, last year I came here to talk about math, and so as a reward, they have me following Jennifer Willett. So that's great. Um, so let me tell you a quick story as we're getting started here. Um, a, about seven years ago, I, I was an atheist, but I'd never been to a Christian church, not for any service or anything. So I'm going to cut you a long story short. I went to a bunch of Christian churches and wrote about, wrote about my experiences in this book called I Sold My Soul on eBay. And after that book came out, one of the cool things was a lot of churches wanted to hear from me as a non-Christian, hey, can you tell us what our church is like? Do you like our church? Would you come back to our church? Um, it's very nice, but no, was typically the answer. But um, one of the things that happened is I got an email from a guy who said, hey, um, I go to a Christian college, and every year we try to bring in someone whose own beliefs are completely different from that of our student body. So a couple years ago, we brought in a feminist. <laughs> and the last year, we brought in a local Democrat. And so we, so we figured, why not bring in an atheist this year? And why don't you come and talk with us about your book? And then he writes, PS. I'm an atheist too, don't tell anybody. <laughs> he says, and he, I find out later, the reason he goes to this really hardcore Christian school is because his dad works there, so he gets free tuition. So we figured, I'll just suck it up for four years, get my, get my degree for free, and then go off and do whatever I want. And that's exactly what he's doing. Um, so I go down there, and I find out, like, first of all, I get to talk to a huge crowd of people who stone-faced me for like an hour and a half. But afterwards, I got to meet this guy's friends, after, uh, and we went out, and we were talking, and it was fun. And I find out that he actually is out as an atheist to just a couple of people, a couple friends of his at school who will not tell anybody, so that's very nice of them and one professor who also will not tell anybody, and that's why he was never expelled. Um, and one of his friends was a Sunday school teacher, and I'm a math teacher, so we have that in common, and we're talking about teaching. No, really, we do. Teaching, I mean, doesn't matter what you're teaching, there's a lot of commonalities. So we're talking about that, and she tells me that as a Sunday school teacher, the curriculum is basically set. She has to teach a certain thing every week to like the eight-year-olds she works with, um, and she gets a little bit of flexibility regarding how she can teach this material to the kids. And so one day, the, the pastor at this church that she works for says, you have to teach kids what a Christian looks like. And here's a bunch of gingerbread men cutouts so you can do that. And she's thinking, there, you can't tell what someone, whether someone's a Christian or not just by looking at them. That's a horrible idea. Why are we teaching eight-year-olds that? And they're like, uh-huh. Here's some more gingerbread men. And then have the kids draw what a non-Christian looks like. She's like, this is not going to go well. But so she tries to explain to the eight-year-olds, kids, you cannot know what someone believes just by looking at them. You don't know if someone's a Christian or not just by their outward appearance. You have to talk to them. You have to get to know them. You have to find out what they really think. And then you can find out if they're a Christian or not. And then, as she was told to do, she gives them the gingerbread men. And so the night I met her, she had saved a couple of the drawings for me, thinking I would appreciate what, um, what these kids thought a Christian looked like. So here's what one of the kids in particular thought um, a good Christian looked like. He's holding a banana in his hand. I just want to point this out. Anyone who's seen Ray Comfort's video, this kid clearly has. Look at this beautiful drawing. The, the hair is nicely combed, and uh, the kid has freckles. He's smiling. If you can't see the speech bubble, he's saying, I love God. He's holding a cross. Uh, his shirt and pants are so nicely colored in. They're tucked in. 
this is an upstanding model person, and therefore they have Christ in their life. Um, that's what a good Christian is like. But what happens when the same kid has to draw what a non-Christian is like? <laughs> yeah, that's all of you. So let's, let's talk about this. The guy's got a bottle of alcohol. Um, he has, yes, <laughs> you're not helping. <laughs> This person has piercings all down their ears. The hair hasn't been combed in who knows how long. He's smoking who knows what. The guy has tattoos that are so bad they're sticking out of his skin. Um, you can't see the speech bubble, but it says, cussing, God isn't real. They didn't even color in the clothes all the way. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. And the guy was so angry, he ripped off, of his, he ripped off his sleeves. And, and he has a unibrow, which is really unnecessary. I don't, I don't know why they had to do that. So here's the deal. This kid's eight. And I guarantee you that Sunday school teacher didn't teach this kid that's what a Christian is and that's what a non-Christian is. But this eight-year-old is picking it up from somewhere. So where's he picking it up from? Is it his church? I honestly don't think any pastor, even some of the crazier ones, are out there saying, this is exactly what will happen if you don't believe in God. This is all the stuff that'll happen. Um, they're not doing that. And I don't think the kid's parents are teaching him that either. But this kid is picking it up from somewhere. And here's what's gonna happen to this eight-year-old down the line. This kid's gonna go to high school and maybe he runs into one of you. He runs into an atheist, and what's gonna happen? The atheist, presumably, doesn't look like that. And so one, there's just confusion all around, but two, before they get a chance to talk, this child already has in his mind a vision of what a non-Christian is like. They know that they're bad, they're evil, they should want nothing to do with them, they should stay away from them, and nothing good can come of a friendship with that sort of person. In fact, don't let them say anything uh, that might challenge them or infect their mind or anything like that. What happens when this kid goes to college and he's supposed to meet with more diverse groups of people? Again, stuck with the stereotype that anyone who's not Christian is just evil and bad and wrong. And I know you see some of this when you're watching like election coverage and it gets to the really extreme types of people who are like, oh, if this person doesn't believe in my God, they must be evil. Um, that's a problem. And the thing is, it happens all the time. I, guarantee, I know this is just one kid's drawing, but I don't think it's that much of an exaggeration. I think a lot of kids grow up, if you tell them, draw what it, what it looks like if someone doesn't believe in God, they're gonna draw you some version of this if they're raised in a lot of churches around this country. So why is that a problem? Well, you just heard Jessica's story not that long ago of what happened when all she did was speak up for her First Amendment rights and they went crazy on her. Um, and why? Because that's how they see Jessica. And as all of you are looking up here, it's like, that, uh, that looks nothing like Jessica. But that's what young atheists have to confront on a regular basis. Now, I'm fortunate enough that I came out as an atheist in high school, at least to most of my close friends, and I didn't have to deal with a lot of crap. But I was also lucky that my friends weren't raised in super religious homes where they were taught to believe that anyone who didn't think like them was a bad person. But if you're from the South, if you're from the Bible Belt, if you're from a lot of rural areas where religion really is a way of life for your community, that's not always the case. And so a couple, uh, last year I started writing a book um, about high school atheists specifically because I think the challenges they have to deal with are unique in a way that even a lot of the college atheists don't have to deal with that sort of pressure. They have to deal with challenges from students who aren't used to meeting people who disagree with them on religion. And so I do want to tell you a story. I want to share with you a few stories uh, today. One of them is not Jessica's, but it almost sounds like it could be. 
And I want, let me tell you about that story. This happened, um, and I apologize, I have a little bit of a cold. This happened a number of years ago. This is about 2004. Um, a girl named Nicole moved to Oklahoma. And her family moved there, and you know she was a freshman. So you would think that's going to be really tough for her to make friends. She has to start from scratch. It's like right in the panhandle to rural, really rural area. But Nicole's athletic. And she's a girl, and she figures, I'm going to try out for some sports teams, because that's how I can make some friends. So she tries out. She tries out for the football team. And she makes it. And she's actually really good. She said the football team players accepted her as one of their own. It was a really good season for her. And then in the winter, she tries out for the girls' basketball team. And she makes it. And at the end of their first game, um, I, don't, I don't even know if they won or lost, but at the end of the first game, they did what a lot of teams do anytime there's like a, a minor league student sort of game. Um, when I played soccer when I was a younger kid, at the end of our games, we would always come together at midcourt, shake each other's hands, you know, say good game, and then go off to our car and cry. That's how it worked. <laughs> in, in Nicole's case, the game ended, and she was weirded out because that's not what they did. The two teams came together at center court, and they all held hands in a circle, and they said the Lord's Prayer. That was a little weird because she wasn't expecting it. She didn't care about the legality or illegality of it, but she just thought that was a little weird. And here's how awesome of a person Nicole is. She thought it was disrespectful for her to join in because she, she was an atheist. She didn't believe in that stuff. So she wanted to step outside out of respect to them. So she told her coach, coach, I don't want to join this prayer circle because I don't believe uh, in God. And the coach said, fine, go to the locker room then. And she did. And the game ended. And you would think that's where that story ends. But it didn't. Because the next day, the coach felt this is a situation that needs to be addressed. So the coach meets with the principal of the school and the superintendent of the school. And they have a meeting about Nicole. And they decide that the best course of action would be to kick Nicole off the team. For what? Who knows? And by the way, they don't even have the decency to tell Nicole they kicked her off the team. The game was on a Friday. On Tuesday, Nicole shows up for the next game, and she sees that her name isn't on that night's roster. And so she goes to ask her coach, why am I not playing tonight? And he says, well, because you stole some kid's sneakers, uh, and you're bad for team morale. And she's thinking, that makes no sense. I, I did borrow another girl's shoes once, but I returned them to her, and I even thanked her for it, and everyone on the team saw me do that. And as for team morale, Nicole was a girl who showed up to practice early to run laps. So how was she bad for morale? It didn't really make any sense, but that's the way it was. The coach said, you're off the team. And imagine being like a girl uh, as a freshman, being kicked off of a basketball team in a really small school, everyone found out about this. And everyone knew that's not really why she was kicked off. They knew she was kicked off because she was an atheist. And so word spread, and then the rumors spread. So imagine what happens when you're the one atheist girl at this high school in Oklahoma. So first of all, kids start calling her names. They found out like her political affiliation that year, had she been able to vote, was Democratic. She would have voted for John Kerry in 04. So they started calling her gay. They found out her parents were mixed race, so they called her uh, an inbreed, mixed breed, half breed, something like that. Nothing nice. Her teachers, when she went on a bathroom break, uh, her teachers would even say things like, I hate that girl. That was documented. Her dad even said, that's like throwing her into a religious gang. Her, she, when she walked down the hallway, she ran into the principal's son once, and the principal's son said to her, the very sight of you makes me want to grab a gun. All of this happened, and Nicole stuck through it. She stayed in school, she went through it, she dealt with that sort of harassment and bullying for the entire year. And then the second year came around, her sophomore year, and she tries out for the basketball team again because she really liked the team and she wanted to be on it. So she tries out for the team and she gets on the team again because she's really good at sports. <clears throat> and this time at the end of the first basketball game, they still do a prayer circle. 
And what happened in this prayer circle is you had, from your perspective, you had the visiting team on this half of the center court circle. You had Nicole's team on this half of the center court circle. And here's Nicole just standing outside the circle, sitting, waiting while they say the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance, all these ways to just praise God. And in fact, someone took a video of this. So let me show you this video. And I'll tell you right now, because the video is going to start, Nicole's the girl standing by herself on the far right. And just watch how that goes down. <laughs> Liberty and justice for all. You see that girl coming up to Nicole at the end, giving her a hug? That girl was one of her teammates, and she, Nicole said that that girl said to her, I forgive you, and God forgives you. <laughs> and then the next day, Nicole was kicked off the team again. And then she asked her coach why, and the coach said, because you threatened to kill someone. <laughs> yeah, that happened. So at this point, her parents are like, this, her dad is saying this is ridiculous, because not only was Nicole getting harassed, her younger brother and sister were also getting harassed, uh, even though they were at different schools. Her dad decides, we're just going to homeschool these kids. It's ridiculous what they're going through. He pulls them out of school, and that's what they do. They get homeschooled for the rest of their high school careers. At some point, Nicole decides, I just want to try to go back. I, I want to be around other kids again. And she goes back to school for like a day. And that one day that she's back, she sees that there's a new kid in school. And that new kid sees her. And he's like, oh, I heard of you. You're that dirty little atheist girl. And then she's done. She didn't want to do public school again. She just stayed homeschooled. So this all happened in like 2004. Her parents, for what it's worth, uh, they filed a lawsuit against the school. American Atheists helped them with that lawsuit, and it was settled out of court as a victory for Nicole's family. So yay for that, but seriously, at that point, does it really matter? Because look at what she had to go through to get to that point. She basically lost her whole high school career you know, because she was out of there. She really didn't get a chance to get an athletic scholarship that she probably would have gotten because she couldn't play those sports because look at what she had to deal with. And that sort of thing, we saw it happen all over again when Jessica's situation came up. And Jessica mentioned uh, Damon Fowler and all these other kids. They still kind of go through the same thing. So what was the difference then? How come, uh, how come Jessica had so much support now? And I would guess most people in this room have not heard of Nicole. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you could thank the Secular Student Alliance. You could thank the way blogs and the internet helps us spread this information and the way our organizations come together to support these kids. Uh, but at the time, in 2004, those networks were not around to support Nicole. It's not like people were driving to those school board meetings in mass to support Nicole. And that's the sort of thing that happened. Um, Catherine Stewart, this author, wrote this great book called The Good News Club about a Christian club that's kind of taken over a lot of schools. And she has a quotation about Nicole in there. Uh, and I'm just going to skim through this. For every Nicole, uh, there are thousands of students who wouldn't go through this. They would just join the circle and mumble the words. They know that the locker room is no place for dissent and that a refusal, refusal to participate is just a lack of commitment to the team. They've learned they have to pray to play. And we know that no student should ever have to resort to that. We know that what the school was doing was wrong, and yet she had to go through it because, you know, we didn't know about it. We didn't know how to stop it. We weren't able to stop it. If this thing happened now, oh my god, we would be, all of us would be driving to that school board, school district meeting together. Um, and putting a stop to it. But these types of stories happen all the time. So over this summer, when I had like the summer break between failing students, um, <laughs> I did a lot of research into all these stories of high school atheists and stuff they've had to deal with over the past few decades. And some of these stories may sound extreme, but they're not that extreme. These types of things have happened for decades, and they're still going on. And the difference is we still don't really know how to deal with it when it comes to high school students. Um, let me tell you another story that's, uh, that you may not have heard of either, because it happened back in the 80s. 
Um, but this one is just as scary, just as damning, <coughs> and it's really disturbing. Um, there was a school in uh, Alabama. Uh, Michael Chandler was a teacher there for 12 years. At a, it's a high school. It's called Valley Head High School, but it's actually a, a school that houses kindergartners through 12th grade. And Michael Chandler was a teacher there for 12 years until he got promoted in the mid-'80s to become the assistant principal. It's a big promotion for him. He's very excited. So the first task he has to do as assistant principal, according to the principal, is he has to schedule the Ponderosa Bible Camp to come to the school and talk about Bible stories to all the classes. That's what he has to do, schedule that time to happen. So Michael is thinking, wait, that's not legal. You can't do that. And he says this to the principal. And the principal's like, uh-huh, do it. And again, this is a new job. Michael's not trying to ruffle any feathers, so he does it. And then the following year, um, the second year as a vice principal, these two girls are transferred into his school. They're in third and fourth grade. They're from another school in the district, so they kind of have the same policies. And Michael's talking to these two girls, kind of introducing them to the new school they're in. And one of the girls asks him, do you guys do Bible stories at this school? And Michael says, yeah, I'm afraid we do. Why do you ask? And this one girl starts crying. And she's like, I hated it because they always made me sit outside in the hallway and all the kids made fun of me. And she's right because the only options were you could sit outside the classroom or go to the principal's office if you didn't want to be a part of the Bible studies. And it's not that her family was atheists. They were Jehovah's Witnesses and they didn't want to do any of that stuff. And so at that point, Michael says, we got to put a stop to this. So he talks to the other teachers, uh, many of whom were his former colleagues as a teacher himself, and he asks them anonymously, how many of you really appreciate alike or appreciate that we do these Bible stories? And he finds out that most of the faculty thinks there's something wrong with it. So with this information, he goes to his principal and he says, look, this is what the faculty's saying. We should not be doing this. And the principal says, fine, we will stop it for all the fourth through sixth graders we won't do the Bible stories. But we got to keep it for the kindergartner through third grade students because, quote, they need their Bible stories. And so this goes on for a while. And so after this, um, Michael has a new challenge. It turns out the Gideons, the people who put the Bibles in the hotel rooms, they start uh, doing their shtick in fifth grade. Uh, because younger than that, it's no good, right? So fifth grade through 11th grade, the Gideons people come into the classrooms and hand out little Bibles. It's like one of these types of books, those little small mini Bibles. And Michael immediately says, you can't do that. There's legal challenges. They could, they could sue our district. And he gets the principal to stop doing that. But the Gideons people say, well, fine, if we can't come into your school, we're just going to hang out on the sidewalk across the street so that when students walk out of the school, we could stop them there. And that's what they do. And it's totally legal. So as these kids are walking to their buses in some cases, the Gideons can catch them and give them Bibles. Michael has some recourse over this. He uh, recourses some of the buses so that they have to pick up the younger kids in the back of the school. But otherwise, there's really no way around this. One day, the Gideons finds out Michael isn't going to be at school. He's at some conference or something. And so they just walk directly onto the buses to hand out these Bibles to kids. And Michael later's like, even in Alabama, that's not right. Like, you can't do that. And then to make it even worse, on one day in Alabama, when it's really hot, the Gideons start throwing the Bibles through the bus windows because they're all down. And the only reason Michael found out about this is because one of the kids came into his office the next day with a cut lip because a Bible hit him in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's funny, but it's scary. <laughs> Don't know how else to phrase that. So at this point, he figures that's, that's the last straw. You can't do this anymore. And at this point, it's like 19. And by the way, this goes on for a while. He does what he can. He starts to talk to lawyers about this, finally, seeing what he can do. 25 lawyers he talks to in Alabama, none of them will take his case because no one wants to be associated with anyone who's trying to take Bibles and prayers out of public school. So no one takes his case. He finally gets in touch with the ACLU and they say, just document this stuff for a couple years so we have a strong game. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we have a strong case. So Michael starts documenting everything. 
and it takes a long time for this case to run its way through the courts. Um, so 1994 is when Michael started documenting all this stuff. And in 2000, even the Supreme Court had to get involved with this to finally put an end to this case. In the end, Michael did win, but it took a long period of time for that case to happen. And how many teachers, how many administrators would have done what he had done? And by the way, I do want to say one more thing about uh, Michael Chandler. Uh, this is one of the things he said. The, uh, his son, came, one of the things that led him to file the lawsuit, besides the Gideons, besides the Ponderosa Bible Camp, is the Gideons still came into some of the kids' classrooms uh, in the school, and he didn't know about it. And one day, his own son came home with one of these Bibles. And he said, son, why did you take that Bible? He, the son said, I didn't think I had a choice. They just handed it to me. And that's when Michael thought it was the last straw. He said the separation of church and state failed because the school gave the impression that accepting the Bible was something he was just supposed to do. It had this school stamp of approval on it. So, <clears throat> so after all this, Michael finally won his case. And the one thing that I think is worth repeating after all this is that uh, Michael, he's a Christian. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> So it's nice to have allies there, but we know that a lot of teachers, atheists included, administrators included, they would not have done what he had done. They would not have put their own jobs on the line, their own careers on the line, to fight for the First Amendment, to fight for the Constitution. Um, so this happened 20 years ago. It started 20 years ago. It only ended like uh, in the year 2000. <laughs> and so that's all the bad news. Let's talk about something a little happier now. Things are getting better for high school students, too. You guys have all seen these reports that younger people are becoming less religiously uh, inclined. And this is one that came out a couple years ago that was really famous. Uh, it's from the Pew, Pew Forum. And you can see that when you're looking at millennial generation, or uh, I'm sorry, the silent generation, the greatest generation, basically anyone born before 1945, um, only about 8% of them are not religiously affiliated. But what happens when you go to the baby boomers? 13%. Generation X, how many of them don't have a religious affiliation? 20%. Sounds impressive. And then you go to the millennials, anyone born after 1981. And if that's you, raise your hand for a second. Lovely. That's a lot of people. So that's 26%. That's one in four people don't have a religious affiliation. But I have to apologize because this graph is like a year old. And a couple months ago, a more recent version of this came out. And look at that top line. They pegged it at as about 32% are religiously unaffiliated. And that's about a third. So about a third of the people under the age of 30 are not religiously affiliated. That means it's very easy for young people to meet other people who are not religious. Those stereotypes are starting to get busted and everything they're learning in church about what it means to not believe in God or believe in a Christian God, that's changing as well. Um, and one thing that's really exciting, I worked with the Secular Student Alliance for a long time, so this, this bar graph means a lot to me. If you look at how fast the SSA has grown over the years, this is going from the fall of 2004 to the fall of 2012, you could see the growth in the number of groups is basically shooting up. Um, and it's actually closer to 400 now. So that's very exciting that this growth is happening. But I want you to pay special attention to what's going on at the high school level. This is what started on the far left in 2007. There were about two groups. Um, and you get all the way to spring of 2011 when there's like a dozen. And then uh, the SSA actually got money in their budget to hire uh, JT Everhart at the time, who was specifically working on high school atheist groups. And now they've since hired someone else to work on the high school affiliate level. And I want to, you to take a look at what's happened in the spring of 2012. That's what's happened. <coughs> That's 47 as of last spring, and it's probably closer to 60 today. So the number of high school atheist groups is jumping up like I would say exponentially, but it's just jumping up at a huge, huge 
uh, at a, a speed. But that's a huge deal. And what, one of the consequences of this is that students are now getting attention for being atheists in a high school, and it's not always bad attention. Sometimes you get attention just for being there. Um, one example is the Chicago Tribune called me up not that long ago, and they said, we heard that you know, the number of non-believers are on the rise. Do you think you could point us to a few? Sure, let me send you to like a bunch of high schools and a bunch of colleges in the area. And this reporter sat in on a bunch of their meetings and did this wonderful, wonderful article about what they're up against and the sort of things they have to deal with. And it's this wonderful, positive article with smiling, happy atheists on the cover, and it's great. Um, last year, a lot of you may have seen this article in the New York Times, and it's about a high school uh, called Rutherford High School in Florida. And here's what the article is about. There's an atheist group at Rutherford High School that's it. That's the whole article. There's an atheist group at Rutherford High School, and they meet in room 13-211. <laughs> That's the entire article. And what's the, the kicker here is you read this wonderful article about this group and why they were formed and what they do there. And at the very end, there's a couple heartbreaking lines. One of them is from a girl whose parents can't find out where she is after school. So she tells her mother, I'm at Ocean Club. She has to lie about where she is just so she can talk about religion in an open forum where she's not censored. Fellowship of Christian Athletes don't have to do that. I guarantee it. And this is one other girl whose dad is in the Navy and she didn't want to upset him. She asked that her name not be used for fear that it would hurt her father. I don't want us to grow apart over this. And this, again, how can you read that and not feel for these students? And again, what are they doing? They're showing up to discuss religious beliefs. They're not doing anything bad. Um, so after reading this article, I got in touch with the faculty sponsor of this group. His name is Michael Creamer. And I talked to him, and I wanted to know what, how he got involved with all of this. And his story is really incredible, too. He said he's been teaching at the school for 30 years. And for 30 years, when students asked him what church he went to, which is a question a lot of teachers get in the South, um, he always said, you know, I try not to answer that question. I don't think, you know, I should tell my students what I believe or don't believe or anything. So I, you know, respectfully, I'm not answering your question. And then he said, every time they asked that to the Christian teachers near me, they would never answer it the same way. They would always say, oh, I go to this church or I go to that church. How come they were never saying, oh, you know, I would tell you, but I should really keep that to myself. The Christian teachers never did that. So finally, he's like, fine, I'm not going to do it either. If a kid asks me, I'm going to be honest. So the next time a student asked him what church he went to, he said, you know what, I actually don't go to church, and my wife doesn't go to church. We're actually both atheists. It was a little weird at first, but the kids basically were like, oh, all right. And that was it, and it wasn't a big deal for him. And eventually some kids in his class said, we want to start a group for atheists. Do you think you could be the sponsor for it? And he said, sure, why not? Um, and really what they do is they have discussions about different religious beliefs. And if they don't know about a particular religious belief, they do some research on it. And they present it objectively. And they watch movies and they talk about this stuff. And about a quarter of the kids who come to their meetings are religious kids who just want to learn about what non-religious people are going through. And I asked him what the response was when this New York Times article came out. And he said, the article mentioned that we had a couple books in our free thought library, maybe something like The God Delusion, that you know, he had on his bookshelf in the classroom because kids could not check it out from the library because their parents would find out, but he had it in his uh, classroom bookshelf, uh, his classroom library, so the kids could get it from there. He said when the article ran, he got so many books from other people just wanting to thank him and his group for what they did that his entire classroom is now lined with free thought books. Not only that, he got so many emails and letters from students and teachers saying how excited they were to find out that another atheist group is out there. Because you see Christian groups everywhere, so why can't you have an atheist group? And the truth is, there's no reason you can't. And so that's what he wanted to send the message of, like everyone should do it. Especially if you're a faculty sponsor like him who has tenure and isn't in danger of losing his job over this sort of a thing. There's no reason to keep it in. So we encourage people to come out of the closet with that sort of thing. Um, so what can all of you do after all of this? This is Michael Kramer. So what can all of us do? 
One thing is, if you're a college student again, raise your hand. If you're a college student, you probably know high school students. You probably know kids at the school you went to. Help them start an atheist club. There is a law in Congress that says if your school has any extracurricular club that isn't just academically related, the yoga club, the drama club, anything like that, you can have an atheist club. So let's start one because it's so important for kids to be exposed to atheists at an early age. And again, I'm not suggesting we try to convert everyone uh, who's a high school student. Honestly, I'd be opposed to that. But I think it's great to give them exposure to atheists and let them know what we're thinking, what we're talking about, because churches are not the best places to have discussions about differences of opinion when it comes to religion. So let's start these atheist groups, and there's no reason you can't start it. If you're going into the education field, uh, consider learning about these issues so that if you have an atheist student in your class, you can deal with some of this stuff as well. Um, another thing, and I know you've heard this over and over, just start coming out, letting people know you're an atheist whenever you can, because as you do that, people, people like to hear when other atheists come out, and it's really powerful. Um, so at the end of all of this, this is just a glimpse of some of the stuff I've been working on. The, the sad part about this is that there are so many stories of atheists who have had so many obstacles to deal with, whether we're talking about prayers at athletic events, there are stories now about a cheerleader, a cheerleading team in Texas holding prayer banners for the football team to run through. That's just a fraction of the sort of uh, things that are happening to push religion in public schools. Graduation events, assemblies, this, there's religion in public schools everywhere. And it takes someone uh, like Jessica Alquist, it takes some of these strong high school students and occasionally a, a strong teacher and administrator to step in and do something about it. Um, and I've written a book about this stuff and it'll be out. Um, we don't want to see that anymore. It'll be out in a couple weeks. It's called The Young Atheist Survival Guide. Um, it should be out by Thanksgiving and it kind of documents all of these stories, what all of us can do to help these students. Uh, whether or not you're atheist, because believe me, this is not just an atheist-only issue. This should concern everybody. Um, and so I hope that's something you're interested in. And if you have any other further questions about this, uh, please let me know. So thank you.